How does our upbringing shape our beliefs? Join us in today's episode as we delve into the fascinating world of the subconscious mind with Nicole Woody, Master Coach at the Napoleon Hill Institute. Nicole shares her transformative journey from depression to empowerment, revealing the profound impact of the subconscious beliefs on our lives. Stay tuned. Would you like to think and grow rich? If so, keep on listening. This podcast is dedicated to those who have found their way from fear to freedom and for those who are considering undertaking this amazing journey. This is the Courage to Be podcast, and I am your host, Tanya Vasayo. Before we get into this episode, I'm thrilled to share that I'm hosting a series on how people's lives have been influenced by the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If you'd like to learn and apply how to think and grow rich, go to the show notes to get some wonderful free resources and join the Courage to Be community. I look forward to being your guide and mentor so you can transform your life. Welcome, Nicole. I am so excited to have you on the Courage to Be podcast. So excited to have you here. Oh, thank you, Tanya. It's truly an honor to be here with you. Thank you so much. Please share with us in your own words what it is that you do and tell us a little bit about your story. Thank you. I'm a business owner here in South Australia in the Adelaide Hills. I run the Elysian Sanctuary Holistic Centre for Peace and Wellbeing. And I've been doing that for 14 years. I've been in service uh, for quite a while with people from all over the world and all over Australia. And I specialize in holistic therapies and, of course, through the training with the Napoleon Hill Institute, doing coaching as well to help everyone to create their best lives. And everything that I've ever done has been based on being for the greater good of all. And that's basically my motto. If it's not done in that way, it's not done. You know, it's always from the heart and it's always finding what people are needing and delivering it to them. I love that. And how did you start the Holistic Center? So you said you've had that for 14 years. And Uh, how did all that journey come about? Because I'm sure there have been moments (laughs) of courage that you've had to tap into. Yes, so much courage. I, I think with everyone, you know, we all start from humble beginnings. And, you know, I'm like everyone else. I had my fair share of challenges, like, you know, loss and grief of family members. My father passed away and he inspired and so did my son helping others because, you know, he really suffered, you know, the end of his life, my father. So that's why I felt it was important for there to be authentic, sincere services for holistic therapies to assist people to help them to even prevent getting that sick, you know. And so for me personally, you know, I went through depression, you know, lots of different challenges. And I I think the biggest thing that people go through when they want to get anywhere is the people that are around them. (laughs) And that seemed to, you know, when I was starting out, that seemed to have been my biggest challenge. It was family and friends and, you know, all the naysayers that try to, put you off your path and create a lack of belief in yourself and what you're doing. And so I found that was probably the hugest thing for me because, you know, we all look to the people closest to us when we're, you know, needing confidence and to believe in ourselves. And obviously I had my support circle, which I'm very grateful for, but I find that being the people that you're around is so important. And so that transition of, who I used to be and who I was becoming attracted different people into my life over the years as I grew and I evolved out of who I used to be into who I needed to be to actually be in service and to do things to the capacity that I do now. So, yeah, the courage, (laughs) you you dig deep, don't you, when you are starting out, you've got to dig deep. And I think a lot of people, you know, if they're, you know, being real, and realistic about it you know there's a lot of internal work that goes on to be able to get to where you get to this is fascinating to me so your dad was was sick and then he passed away he didn't get the care that he needed and then you mentioned that you went into a sort of depression which obviously it doesn't seem 
you know, anyone that knows Nicole, and if you listen to her laughter, you know, you <laughs> wouldn't picture that, you know, so no. that obviously is your new image, your new you, you know, that you've been being for a while, and we all evolve. But talk to us about that moment where you were in that space of depression. And, you know, like, what did that look like? And how did you get yourself out of there? Yeah, it's because, you know, we believe we believe we need certain things to be safe and to be able to do what we need to do. And when I think that whenever anything falls down around you, it's a launching pad. And that's what it was for me. And I'm the kind of person that I don't like to stay in those things. I, I like to find a way. So yeah, exercising, walking was my go-to. And I thankfully live on the coastline of South Australia, which is has the, the most beautiful, to me, the most beautiful beaches in the world. And I, I went for lots and lots of walks and did my affirmations and would repeat them while I was walking of whatever I needed to reprogram myself into. And it was from having enough. It was from having enough of feeling that way because I'm not the kind of person to stay in those uh, kinds of states. So, yeah, walking, meditation, self-healing and I used energy healing as well I learned energy healing and used it on myself and found that that's how I was tapping into my subconscious to be able to access the subconscious memories there that were inherited generational and also from childhood as well so I did a lot of work on myself privately to be able to transform that myself at that point Nicole, did you already have the holistic center or not yet? Like you were no. learning about all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm the kind of person that I like to know that something's real, <laughs> you know, through my own experience of it. So if I learn something and something comes to me that, you know, I could use, I always apply it to myself first. I always make sure that I know how it works and it's always done internally first. And I think that's where the authenticity comes from. You need to be authentic. And authenticity comes from being able to vibrationally shift your energetic signature to what it needs to be to do what you need to go and do. And it's all in the subconscious. It's all in the vibrational memories that we hold. And that fascinated me. So I studied more about all of that as well. But yeah, it all started from healing myself and wanting to do that naturally as well and wanting to find a way of how does that work and yeah so working on myself and then I'd help family members like my sisters and friends and the word got out and because they were having miraculous <laughs> results and yeah it was just that's how everything started to grow people just were contacting me all the time asking me for help because they could see my own transformation and then everyone around me that I was helping and where word of mouth got out and I haven't stopped since. <laughs> so share with us what kind of modalities for anyone that might be listening that you start applying with for yourself that then you felt a calling to be able to help others in this direction? Well, when we're talking about quantum energy healing, it's quite a vast topic and to be able to work with the energy meridians and go deep into the subconscious of the body and then into the energy bodies takes a lot of skill. But like I said to you, you've got to do it on yourself first to be able to access it in other people. I am very lucky. I'm clear audience. I can, it's called clear hearing. And I always had clear sentience, which is clear, clear sensing and clairvoyance, which is clear vision, all of these intuitive abilities that were there throughout my life. And the clear audience kicked in when my father passed. So doing energy healing and being able to use all of those intuitive skills combined is how I do everything I do. It's the foundation of everything I do. This is fascinating because so clear audience is the one that's the strongest, but obviously you work with the other two too, like clear sentient and you said and clairvoyance. How are you feeling it or how are you seeing it? And how do you hear these things? And how did it show up with your dad when he passed? I could hear clearly what to do. It's not your own thoughts. You know, it's not yours. 
you know, people call it God, people call it universal intelligence. And I could hear very clearly what needed to be done for my family and for myself once dad passed and left his body and everything just kept on working that way from that point on. So everything I do is based on that. Everything I do with coaching and working with clients now, being able to hear the information on the energy while they're speaking. So for instance, they may be talking about their dog, but I can hear the subconscious belief that's going on in them that's creating their current circumstances or limitations or symptoms. And that's why a lot of people like to see me (laughs) because it's just an instant knowing. That is amazing. So how can the regular person, normal person like myself (laughs) have more into these type of what would you call it gifts, you know, that we all carry as human beings, because I do believe that we all have the capability, you know, to connect with that intuitive yes. side of ours. How could we develop it more, Nicole, as people are listening? Yeah, I, I believe it's, you know, I think a lot of people need to go with what they have faith in. Everyone's got their individual belief system that they work with. And so people that I've worked with over the years have asked me, to assist with them, I always check what they believe in first because what you believe in, of course, is the foundation of everything. And so if someone is connected more to God or Jesus or, you know, some people love Mother Mary and then other people as well more connected to, let's say, their loved ones in spirit, you know, their grandfathers or their grandmothers or their mothers or fathers, people that they trust. It's about trust and you have to trust your connection. You have to trust what you're believing in. So that's why it's so important. So we'll give it an example. So what do you believe in, Tanya? I believe in infinite intelligence and my intuition. And that's the label I like giving it or spirit, just because I grew up in a Catholic country at the end of a dictatorship. So they kind of force Catholicism on us. And I've always been very, what's the word? rejecting the dogma or that you have to follow that I must follow the belief or that someone else is more connected to God to give me the answers, meaning a priest or someone else in the, in that organized religion. But I do consider myself very spiritual and intuitive. So sometimes like I still Mm -hmm. working to not get triggered with the word God, you know, because it's like, "Ah," you know, what we're talking about here. Right. And like, as soon as I said the word God, And like you said, there was a vibrational resonance that triggered a memory in you subconsciously. Okay, that's the energy thread. That's the tip of it. And so we're going to go with that. And then we're going to find the memories through that energetic thread and free your consciousness so you can have a clear connection with your true self and universal intelligence. And so everything that's happening around us is always giving us answers all the time. And so every, I call it catalysts. (laughs) So, you know, we may have a a catalyst of something happens around us. Someone says something, we have an emotion, we were witness to something, we're a part of an incident. You know, we may hear something. There could even be sensory triggers that, you know, smell, taste, different things that trigger memories in people's bodies and, and then therefore their energy body and then their soul. And so we find those triggers, those threads, and we clear the energy going back to your true self to bring your life force energy, your creation energy into a awareness that is not smothered or influenced by something that is tainted by fear or something that is not life. And so then we would transform that. And there's many ways you can do it. Lots of people have different ways that they like to do it. Again, it depends on people's pathways, you know, but yeah, the transformation of the inner belief and then the memories that are not true. And so I'd start there if anyone was going to work on developing their own skills, because as you said, everyone's got their own abilities. Everyone's got their own intuitive abilities. And when we free our subconscious and free those energies that aren't life and aren't true back to creation energy, then our intuition just naturally gets stronger. It's like everything. The more you practice it, the better you get. Wow. Talk to us a little bit because you mentioned the subconscious. 
And this is such an important part. And, you know, this is something that we obviously talk about at the Napoleon Hill Institute, That's you know, right. explain to us and for anyone that really might not understand how the subconscious mind works. Can you give it to us with your own words and your perspective of our conscious mind versus our subconscious mind, like you're saying, so that we can free up that space to connect with one of our higher faculties, intuition, how yeah. would we go about, like, how do we start understanding subconscious mind? Well, of course, when we're looking at the subconscious mind, it's an accumulation of every memory that the soul has. So everything that's ever experienced in multiple incarnations with basically information on energy. So it's, it's data on energy. And so when we're looking at that, then we've got the energetic structure of it. And then we also have the other side where it's a culmination of belief and habits that we have stored within our subconscious through emotion and through believing things to be true and making a clear decision with emotion. We have moments in our lives where we have things happen and then we have that clear defining moment where we make that decision with immense emotion and it just goes straight into the subconscious and it becomes part of our programs. So there's the energetic soul influence side of a culmination of memories with energy, with information on it. And then there's the other side of it as well, where we have all of our beliefs that we have stored with those emotions and habits. And, you know, over time they become part of our personality and they influence, of course, as we know, the subconscious influences 95 to 97% of one's life. It's a very big thing. So if we're transforming anything that is not life, then we're freeing our subconscious to be more aligned with the creation energy of life. And then our frequency, our vibrational resonance as individuals is going to be more in alignment with that oneness. So that's why it's so fabulous to be able to understand the subconscious and be able to transform our beliefs. And that's what we specialize in with all the training that we've done in the Napoleon Hill Institute, all the coaches like yourself as well, Tanya, we specialize in working with people with their beliefs and with their paradigms and what's limiting them to transform that mentally, subconsciously, and then it becomes a vibrational resonance as well that ends up attracting more growth and success and prosperity, love, whatever you focus that consciousness on and want to create, you're going to have a clear vibrational resonance if you clear those subconscious memories that aren't serving you. So, yeah, the subconscious is so vast and, you know, we've obviously our conscious mind is, you know, regurgitating a lot of programming and we don't even know. We regurgitate conditioning all the time. I've got to catch myself out whenever I say anything that's limited. This is fascinating. And I appreciate you sharing, you know, because we're seeing that you have an understanding that you've been studying this, that you've been practicing this for many, many years. And I'm curious for someone that might be, this is the first time they're hearing it, you know, that they're like, what? Like my beliefs, like they're kind of questioning, but it makes absolute sense. Do you have a story the first time that you heard this or that you started realizing that, oh my God, this has been programmed to me, you know, and been passed down yeah. through my parents, ancestors, yeah. please share a story with us. Let's take a pause yeah. one second, Nicole, before you share that story, okay? Sure. I want to invite you to something amazing. Last week at the Napoleon Hill Institute, we hosted the Think and Grow Rich with Peace of Mind event which is based off of the last book that Napoleon Hill wrote before he passed. During this event, we learned so many amazing things like why you're not getting the results you want, how the mind truly works, our six higher intellectual faculties that need to be exercised daily, and what creates your body manifestations. You can no longer listen to the event, but you can catch the replays until this Sunday, March 10th at midnight. How do you get the replays? Go to the show notes, click on the link for the event, get registered, and you'll get an email with the replays. And if you happen to listen to this podcast past March 10th, then just go to the show notes and download the free PDF book of Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. You'll have an entry point into this fascinating world that will get you closer to achieving your dreams and goals 
This work is life transforming. So we're back. Nicole, please share with us this story about the first time or one of the first times that you discovered about the subconscious and what that might have been doing for you. Sure. It was when I was in my 20s, actually, and I had had a moment with my mom and we weren't seeing things the same way. And, you know, she had said, you know, a lot of repetitive things from when I was young, when I was born and how her and dad had marital issues and my dad, she said that my dad turned to another woman, right? And this was this was something she would repetitively said to me throughout my childhood as a memory of when I was born. And I don't think that she even realises how damaging that is, it's, you know, how psychologically damaging that is to say to a child. And I formed the belief that I wasn't loved and I didn't even know. I had no idea that I even felt I, you know, as I got older, I felt that, you know, I've got a good relationship with mum and dad, you know, but it came down to just having a realisation through these memories when I was in my relationship and then I was starting to feel like my partner didn't love me. And so it was transferring over to my partner and I was believing it. I truly believed it. I was like, he can't love me if he's, you know, doing certain things. And I was convincing myself of it because my subconscious was programmed with it. And I had to really be honest with myself and go, no, these aren't my thoughts. These, these are my mum's thoughts. My mum repeated this to me regularly throughout my life. And I chose to believe, I chose to believe what she was saying and I interpreted it that I wasn't loved. And so I associated that with my father in my masculine energy of relationship and love. And as soon as I really, really loved my partner and felt immense love and just passion and just never loved anyone as much as I've loved him, it started pouring out into our relationship. And I had to really be honest with myself and look at, how I was creating that because my partner was perfect, perfect for me. He wasn't doing anything. There was nothing he was doing. And so I started to realize that all the thoughts I was thinking were my mum's. And that was a really empowering moment then. And it wasn't a thing of attacking my mum or thinking negatively of her or having a problem with her. It was simply just realizing that what she told me and what I chose to believe, taking responsibility is the big thing. I chose to believe it, right? And taking responsibility for myself and realizing I chose to believe it. I don't have to believe it anymore. And if I want to have a better relationship, more peace in my relationships with anyone and even myself, even my own self-love, I'm the one that chooses my thoughts. I'm the one that chooses the way I'm going to perceive life. I'm the one that decides everything. And I realized at that moment as well, that I was giving my power away to other people to choose it for me. And I was I was responsible for that. No one else. So no one's to blame. There's no blame game. It's simply I'm responsible for me. So I learned responsibility, self-accountability, you know, with that. And that, yeah, whatever I'm choosing to believe, I'm literally going to be manifesting into my life through my own thinking and beliefs. So it was a very, and this was way before I even knew about Napoleon's work. But, yeah, I started having those realizations and I was like, okay, Something deep is going on here, (laughs) you know. But it's fascinating how we can be controlled by a belief for a long period in our life, like I was, you know, until in my 20s. And I had to choose my own thinking, didn't I? I had to choose my own thoughts. And so I thought, okay, if I can believe someone else's thoughts, I can create my own. So tell me about that because this story is incredible. I love how self-aware you were at that time, how you took responsibility and then they just made a decision and said, I don't have to believe if I believe this for all these years, why not choose a different belief now? So exactly. I love that. How do you, you know, obviously now you're much more evolved. You are much more aware. You've been doing the work a lot more. What happens when you like, how do you go about catching yourself? Because we're in evolution, you know, you're at a higher level, yeah. but do you catch yourself? Do you have kids, by the way, Nicole, or no? Uh, yes, I have a son, yeah. And yeah. so how have you caught yourself? Because as a mom, I have a 10-year-old and trying to 
I'll catch myself sometimes, you know, that I have a belief or that I'm past. I'm like, oh my God, that's going to damage her. She's going to come they're the, back. Yeah, they're the beliefs. greatest teachers. Yeah, your kids are the greatest teachers and they are the greatest mirrors as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm very honest. You've got to be honest with yourself. I don't lie to myself. That's, you know, I'm always hearing myself. I hear everything I say. A lot of people are speaking on automatic unconscious. I've spent enough time meditating and going into my subconscious and I've programmed myself as well that, you know, I, I always have said to myself for years, I trust and have faith that I will always be able to see the truth of myself. And it's really important because without truth, there's no connection. There's just no connection to infinite intelligence. We require truth to be able to access it to its full capacity. And it's not just truth in the way that we think things are as truth. It's a vibration. It's a energy. It's an energetic signature within us that opens up the connection to our true selves. So we have to be honest. And I'm always very honest. I'm always honest about what I say about other people if I'm speaking I'm always very honest and in truth. I'm very honest about myself. I always find that if anything is being trying to make it into something else, that's just not the way I am. It just has to be as it is or not at all. <laughs> and so I, I make that a firm rule for myself. Everything has to be truth and honest. Yeah. Love that. And I think that's part of what you mentioned at the beginning that I've always been attracted to you is your authenticity. And you can feel when someone's being authentic, when someone's being honest, you know, and, and sense that through. So going back to your son, how old is your son right now? Oh, uh, he's 27. So how was this upbringing with him and applying this kind of work? You know, like how has that dance been? Like, what have you learned from him? How have you passed down and done differently than your parents did? Because I always say our parents did the best they could with the knowledge and the tools they had. Exactly. We now have knowledge and tools that are maybe more advanced. I mean, that's part of evolving the human race, right? Next generation should have better knowledge, more tools. So how yeah. was that upbringing with your son knowing what you know now and what did you learn with him? Well, ever since I was young, I just absolutely loved everyone. I adored my parents. I really, really just loved everyone. And so, you know, I just used to look at their lives and learn from them. And I used to ask them things about their stories. I was fascinated with my grandparents' stories as well. And in my family, like most families, there's a huge amount of generational trauma you know, there's influences of war. Both my grandfathers were in the war. That influenced the way that they brought up their children. It was very strict and violent. Both my parents had violent upbringings and domestic violence and seeing their mothers uh, being harmed and they were harmed as well. And so, you know, when I look at all of that, and that was influenced by alcoholism on my dad's side, not my mum's, but, you know, you reflect on those things and you see the results. And my parents tried to do better because they had they, their childhood was so, you know, traumatic. And so I was aware that I needed to, and my dad and my mum were a big influence, you know, in bringing up my son as well, my father in particular, because he was such a gentle, loving man. He was the best father ever. I loved my dad. And he inspired me. And so did my son. As soon as I had him, I knew that it was, I chose to do it. I chose to have him. I chose to bring him into the world. So whatever I could do, I was going to do to try to not pass on the generational trauma. And through, and that was the other inspiration of healing myself as well with my son to make sure that, you know, even telepathically and vibrationally, I wasn't passing things on, but, you know, you can't control it all. I mean, that would be an ideal world, wouldn't it? <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I've always taught him that he can be anything that he wants to be and that he thinks we got, it's a fine line with kids, you know, you've got to do it. I found when he went to school that when, you know, he was with the teachers, so he was saying to them, my mum, said that I'm equal to all of you. <laughs> I love it. And that I can do anything I want. And I'm, you know, getting calls from the school, you know. Uh, so I had to be careful, you know, how much I empowered him. But obviously, you know, teaching him how to work with society but still be himself. And I just looked at it as that I was going to sh save him a lot of years of therapy. 
<laughs> by allowing him to be himself. And so that's what I did. I allowed him to be himself. And from my influence and him seeing me meditating, and I've done a lot of healing work on him as well for, you know, his generational memories in his subconscious. And uh, now he's a traditional yogi. He teaches. He's actually more advanced than me on a spiritual level, he believes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which is funny. And so, yeah, he's got an immense amount of knowledge. He's a personal trainer. He knows everything about the body. He knows everything about the energy bodies. And uh, yeah, he's in service and helps people. He actually works at my at my sanctuary that I created. Yeah, everything's aligned for him to be on his path of service now as well. So yeah, I just made sure that I did the best I could, like all of us, you know. I wouldn't say I was perfect. I wouldn't say I got it all right. But each time you, you know, anything that does happen, that does come up, it's an opportunity for both of us to learn. And that's the way I always saw it. Yeah. That is awesome. I love hearing this and being able to create those kind of relationships with the next generations, you know, that's great. Yeah. One last thing before we start wrapping up here, you have the sanctuary, you've mentioned meditation, you know, you obviously are super mega connected with all your, your intuition and, you know, all the other senses. What are some of your daily rituals that you can inspire some of us? I get up at sunrise and absorb the frequency. I breathe the sun in. I have my feet barefoot on the earth. I live in the Adelaide Hills in the mountains. So the sun comes up over the mountains here and it's a really important time of day and I do pranayamas that are kriya pranayamas and because they open up your meridians and clear your body they also have lots of benefits for your physical health as well but basically one kriya doing it for one and a half minutes is the equivalent to a whole year of spiritual growth can you tell us for anyone that has never yeah. heard the word Kriya and what this means and what it entails? Well, you know, traditional Kriya yoga, and I'm not a traditional Kriya yogi, so I'm not actually allowed to divulge all of the wisdom with that, as my son has explained to me. But, you know, when it comes to traditional Kriya yoga, it's thousands of years old. It's the wisdom of the ages that, you know, so many traditional uh, accumulated the wisdom through traditional yoga traditional breath work and so you're combining the breath work with the asanas and the stretches and the body work that you do is so vast I'm not a master of it so I'm just aware that there's certain masters that are supposed to address that in the way that it needs to be addressed but Kriya in itself has been a life changer for me and so of course I do energy healing on myself I do my auto suggestions as we do with the Napoleon Hill Institute. And I make sure that I'm absorbing the red light from the sun and breathing it in and filling myself with that pure prana and being a clearer vessel for creation to flow through to be able to create from. That is beautiful. And when you're saying auto suggestion, again, also clarifications, because I feel like sometimes we get technical in our words and people are like, what's an auto suggestion? Can you explain what <laughs> yeah. the auto suggestion is all about, Nicole, for anyone? Yeah, that's we, we learned it from the Napoleon Hill Institute, but you know, it's basically writing out affirmations and mantras to reprogram your mind and to take possession of your mind as well. Because if you're not taking possession of your mind, then your mind can easily be, be influenced by external things, kind of, and external environments. So when we're doing auto suggestion, we're basically writing out to say, I want to feel more motivated. So I'd be writing out, I am motivated over and over and over again while I'm feeling motivated. And so we emotionalize the words. And that's what auto suggestion does it creates a foundational energy for the mind to create the thought vibration that then ends up being emotionalized to integrate it into the heart and it starts to influence our subconscious and our vibrational resonance. That is fabulous. Thank you so much, Nicole. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you? What's the best place? Oh, we spoke about this before. A lot of people have websites, but I don't need one. Everything I do is by word of mouth. So a lot of clients ask me, to create a Facebook page. So I do have the Elysian Sanctuary Holistic Centre for Peace and Wellbeing on Facebook for people to find me if they want to. And, of course, at the Napoleon Hill Institute 
we're always flying high there <laughs> um, on business calls aren't we on the coaching business calls if anyone wants to do their you know coaching certification business coaching through the napoleon hill institute they can find you and i on there yes and- absolutely okay. it's been such an incredible journey and but this one's gonna be to be continued in our next episode so definitely If you're wanting to hear more about Think and Grow Rich and Nicole's journey with Think and Grow Rich, with the Institute and how that's transformed her life, you're going to want to tune in to the other episode we're doing with Nicole. And one last thing, what would be a tip or a golden nugget that you can give our listeners on how to live a life with more courage? Have value for yourself and don't let anyone else create that value for you, but yourself. I love it. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. I am so grateful that you joined me today. If you enjoyed it, there's one thing I'd like you to do. Click on the follow button so you don't miss a single episode. Leave me a rating and a review and please share. As my way to thank you, email us a screen grab of your review at the email in the show notes and we will send you a free Crafting Your Future guided visualization, which is so simple to do with outstanding results. It will empower you and give you the confidence to attract and create the life you've always desired. See you in our next episode.